and the new Chancellor is going to outline later today how the Labour government is going to kickstart economic growth. Yeah, Rachel Reeves is expected to announce some changes to planning rules as well as a commitment to green energy and building one and a half million new homes. Well, we're joined now by her second in command, Darren Jones, who's the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Good morning to you. You're getting used to that yet, that title? <laughs> um, it's nice to have dropped the shadow, yes. <laughs> Out of the shadows. Well, down to business. And uh, certainly you're all going to be busy, aren't you? And you're promising growth, which is a little word, but a very, very big challenge. So to breakfast viewers this morning, how are you going to get the economy growing? So, look, why is this important? It's important because if the economy is firing on all cylinders, uh, people will see great jobs with great pay improving. They'll see businesses making profits, making tax contributions, as they do, to help fund our public services. And the fact of the matter is that over the last 14 years, because of all of the chaos and division, the country has either bumped along the bottom in terms of its growth or it's been going backwards into recession. And if we'd have grown at the average rate of the wealthy countries uh, in the world over that period of time, uh, we have had over £50 billion more each year to help pay for public services. And we don't as a consequence of that failure to get growth into the economy. And that's why the Chancellor Rachel Reeves today in her first intervention is setting out how our first and most important mission in government is to get growth back into the economy so that we can have secure and sustainable public finances again. Yeah, I mean, nobody's doubting it's important growth, but again, how are you going to deliver it? Well, there's a whole host of measures that need to be taken. Um, and the reason for the mission speech today is to set out the immediate steps that the Chancellor and our colleagues around the Cabinet table are going to take to stimulate that growth. And look, it will take some time to come through the system. These things don't just happen overnight. But what we want is for infrastructure to be built, housing to be built, the energy system to be more sustainable so prices don't fluctuate as they have done in the past. Uh, and for the success that we want to see for, for people and businesses across the country so that people are better off and the economy is better off. Uh, you're talking about building houses. Uh, looking through the papers this morning, a lot of them saying that you're going to be building potentially hundreds of thousands of new homes on Greenbelt land, which will be a great concern to a lot of people watching this morning, especially in rural areas. How, how do you reassure them? So we set out during the election campaign uh, our definition of what we call grey belt, which is areas of the country which are not areas of natural beauty, uh, but they are currently defined oddly as green belt and therefore you can't get developments off the ground in those areas. Uh, we think there's some redefinition that can be done there as well as broader planning reform, which you'll hear more about later today, that can unlock the development of housing in areas where it's needed the most. And we know from across the country that whether it's first time buyers trying to get on the housing ladder, people waiting for social and secure housing, uh, or even just the cost of housing in areas uh, where there's the opportunity for economic growth to be um, put back into the economy, that housing delivery is an important lever to be able to make that happen for them. We, we've heard in the past about brownfield sites, the old industrial sites that might be used for, for building, intrigued by grey belt. Obviously, it's going to look at different in different areas of the country. But what, what might a grey belt look like? Well, an example we gave during the election campaign was, I think it was in Tottenham, uh, where there's a former petrol station forecourt, which for uh, historic reasons was within the boundaries defined as green belt, uh, where clearly that's not the case. It wasn't being used for anything. It could be used to put housing on it or other useful bits of infrastructure. And there are lots of pockets of this, of these types of uh, pieces of land across the country, which are currently just standing empty, not serving any purpose, whether for the natural environment or for development and local needs, that we need to be able to unlock to be able to get that investment into the country and those houses being built. You're making that unlocking sound very, very straightforward. But all those new MPs of yours will soon start getting letters from constituents who don't want certain pockets of land built on for, for all kinds of different reasons. And all of a sudden, it's not so easy, is it? Well, look, local communities will still be an important part of the planning process. Applications will still need to be made and consulted on. People will be able to contribute uh, their thoughts and their feedback. But our key focus is on speeding up the planning system, uh, having a focus on growth and tackling inertia, which has basically stopped investors from spending money on the UK and building the infrastructure that we uh, need. But look, local communities are still going to be an important part of that, and they will have their right to have their say protected uh, in law. 
Uh, we've just been hearing from the Conservative Party this morning who are talking about maybe having quite a long leadership campaign. It might not be till the early part of next year that they get somebody else in charge. In the meantime, they're kind of in limbo. And I suppose there might be some concerns from our viewers this morning who think, you know, Labour are just going to get into government and rush through loads of plans without much opposition. What do you say to people who didn't vote for you and, and who want you to be challenged in the House of Commons and not just railroad the system? Well, look, I expect that we will be challenged in the House of Commons. Of course, the Conservative stuff suffered a, an historic loss, uh, but that doesn't mean there's no opposition in the House of Commons. And, of course, we have the House of Lords to get any legislation through as well. And the key thing that you'll see from this Labour government is that we're going to return both to the service of the British people, but also to the norms. The adults are back in the room. Announcements that we make will be made to Parliament. They will follow proper processes through Parliament, and we welcome them to be challenged and scrutinised by colleagues from different parties. That's the right and proper way to do business, and that's what you will have from this Labour government. Because you appreciate that, although the, the, the headline number of seats that you won as Labour is, is enormous, and you've got a big majority, in terms of the share of the vote across the country, uh, it, that wasn't so impressive, wasn't it? Under 40% of people actually voted for you. Well, and I, I find this argument quite, uh, quite amusing. I mean, look, we may have had uh, uh, more people in fewer seats voting for us in previous elections, but we suffered historic losses uh, and nowhere near getting into power. Uh, this is a once in a generation historic victory for the Labour Party and for our Prime Minister Keir Starmer with an enormous majority, larger than even I was expecting when the exit poll landed um, at 10 p.m. on Thursday last week. We're delighted by the mandate that we've received by the British people from across constituencies, across the whole of the United Kingdom, in Scotland and Wales, as well as in England. Uh, and we're very excited to implement our manifesto for change and unleash our decade of national renewal with that consent and mandate from people right across the country. Our inbox is already filling up with questions from our viewers wanting to know about what you're going to do on this subject and that subject. Public sector pay, uh, more money for, for junior doctors. Is there going to be enough money to, to stop them taking more industrial action? Well, look, the Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, uh, made one of his first calls to the BMA over the weekend. He's meeting with junior doctor representatives, I think, tomorrow in the health department. And we want to get a deal done and get this sorted so that we can get junior doctors back to treating patients in the National Health Service. How quickly do you think that could happen? Well, clearly it depends on the negotiation, but the difference you're going to have from this Labour government compared to the former Conservative government is a willingness right at the top of government to get around the table to get the deal done. And remember, this isn't just about pay for junior doctors or for broader public sector workers. This is about working conditions. This is about the importance that we place as a government on public service through our public services and public servants. It's about a culture change uh, that people will get from this Labour government. We're going to reset that relationship. And yes, there'll be difficult trade-offs around the fiscal inheritance and pay, but we're going to do the right thing by our public servants and by the country. And we're going to bring that new culture and approach of public service back to British politics and to our public services. What about our viewers, the so-called waspy women, who want to know what you're going to do on, on their claims for, for changing compensation for, on the state pension? So before the election, the Ombudsman reported on some of the processes that uh, waspy women uh, were subject to about the change in the pension age. What we haven't got to yet is a, a, a level of report or detail about uh, the eligibility for compensation or the different types of schemes that might need to be designed to support people who are in different circumstances. So there's more work to be done on that. Uh, and my colleague, the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, Liz Kendall, has already talked about picking up that work and taking it forward. You say more work to be done, but you know that there are a lot of people out there who are really impatient and who will say, hang on a minute, you've waited in opposition, you've had the polls in your favour for years now, you, you've now got power. What's holding you up? Well, we've been in power for three days, so give us a bit of time. There's not very much we could do at all in opposition, apart from, you know, encouraging the Conservatives to get on with it. And on this issue and a whole host of other issues, they weren't getting on with anything because they were fighting amongst themselves. So we will pick up that piece of work and take it forward. But there is more work to be done. And on that idea, just finally, of, of being in power, to be around the Cabinet table after 14 years in opposition, just on a human level... What did that feel like? Daunting, I imagine. Um, it, it felt pretty surreal, to be honest. And, of course, we'd all been up with no sleep because of the election process 
so it felt a bit like a dream, uh, but it's nice to know that we have the right to be there, that we've been given the mandate to serve the country again, uh, and we're all absolutely thrilled to be there to be able to put our plans into place. Darren Jones, the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury, thank you for joining us here on Breakfast.